Hi, this is Nathan Cole of natesviolin.com, and today we're going to talk all about trills, trill preparation, trill work. Now, why trills? Doesn't it seem like they're just uh, an ornamentation, maybe a way to show off in Baroque and classical music? Or could it be that there's a lot more there that's undiscovered? And you know me, I wouldn't be making a video unless I thought it were a pretty important skill. It turns out that trills are really a fundamental skill on the violin, and that's because if you show me someone with great trills, I can show you someone with a great left-hand setup. Um, it's one of those virtuous circles. You know, you've heard of vicious cycles where one bad thing feeds another. This is the opposite, a virtuous circle where the work you do in one thing feeds something else, and then that feeds the original thing. So when you're working on trills, you're really working on the left-hand frame and setup, and when that improves, trills get a lot easier, and then the great trills improve the frame even further. And in fact, it makes a whole lot of other playing easier too. All left-hand passage work, shifting, you'll be surprised just how far you can go with it if you've never done this kind of work. Now, a lot of people, maybe yourself included, um, think that trills are genetic, having fast and easy trills. You know, you're either born with it or you're not. To a certain extent, that could be true in terms of what you start with, the, the basic material, but it's not genetic where you end up. You can improve your trills. Um, kind of reminds me of upbow staccato, another thing that a lot of people think you're either born with it or you're not. Um, that's also untrue. You can improve that. And um, there's a kind of a funny joke, a very violin joke um, involving trills and upbow staccato. It's about a guy who uh, walks into a violin shop to try bows. And if you know the piece Horace Staccato, you'll appreciate this. This guy goes in and um, starts a... Uh... Good bow, good bow. Never plays the rest. But that joke only works because his trill was good. So I'm going to show you how to work on them. I'm going to take you through my own trill work. It's, uh, it's actually part of my warm-up, so I do this stuff every day. Um, something you should do every day. And once you get comfortable with it, uh, you'll eventually want a metronome or a metronome app to chart your progress. But to start with, uh, that's not necessary. Now what I've done, I've put this whole routine together in a free worksheet. And you can go to natesviolin.com slash trills to download that. And that way you'll have all this together in one place. You can refer to it, print it out, refer to it um, after you watch this video. That'll lay it all out there. So natesviolin.com slash trills. Now trills, the way I think of them, they're not only between adjacent fingers. Uh, Trills can use any combination of fingers. So, but, but to get started with, let's just do one and two. And I want to start by getting a feeling of lightness in the fingers. Because it's not true that for a trill, your lower finger always has to be really, you know, anchored to the string and just press, pressing really hard. That's the way I learned in the beginning. You know, lower finger, in this case one, really rock solid, and then a light second finger the hand just doesn't work that way. If you're really scrunching with one finger, it's going to affect the upper finger as well. So with trills, in fact, with all playing, you want to have the minimum necessary pressure. And I have another video on that. It's called uh, MVP, Finding Your Minimum Violin Pressure. So check that out. Um, even though the left hand pressure now is going to be the minimum you need to stop the string, the bow pressure, I want always to be strong. A nice singing forte, let's call it. And that's because if you only practice these trills with a quiet bow, which is what happens to a lot of people when they have a quiet left hand, the bow gets really quiet too. If you only do that, then you're going to find that your fingers will easily stop the string. And then when it's time to play forte, which we do so often, you're going to have to do this work all over again <laughs> to learn the finger pressure necessary to stop a forte string. If you do it this way around and always practice forte, you're going to find it very easy, easy to adapt this to quieter playing. So keep that in mind. We're going to have the light left hand, strong right hand, and we're going to work between one and two at first. I'm just going to pick uh, a low one and a regular two on the A string. So that'll be B flat C, a little whole step in between. Um, we're going to alternate those fingers starting slowly. When I say alternate, I mean that when one goes down, two comes up, and vice versa. So... All 
I want to get a nice smooth action to the fingers, not, not anything too machine-like and uh, again, really light both fingers. I'm going to start to get the motion fast, but I'm not going to push myself past what I can comfortably do. So. And you may get that faster, you may not, but it's, it's wherever you, you end up. It's about getting that lightness in the fingers and feeling as though the two fingers start to blend together into one unit. This is very important for the trills. So feeling as though it's not two separate fingers, but this, this little block of one, two. Now if you hear open strings in between, then you know your timing is not quite right. You've got both fingers off the string at the same time. You don't want that. So just slow it down a bit so that you can um, get things back nice and smooth, well-timed. That's the opening exercise. And it's the only time that you're going to lift lower fingers up because from now on, all your lower fingers are going to remain on the string. Of course, that means one is always going to be on the string because one will always be a lower finger. Not pressed into it again, but just resting there. If you're working with three and four, for example. You're going to want one and two always on the string, and then of course three because it's the lower finger in the trill. So just keep that in mind. Keep those fingers down resting on the string. Now we're going to start with one trill. It's what we called in Suzuki growing up uh, the hot potato. So we imagine that the string was burning hot. That's the hot potato. Um, I want a nice gentle placing of the finger, so I don't want to hear any thumping on the string. It's going to be placed very gently, but then lifted with great energy, again, as if the string is red hot. So the finger lifts up and back, so not up and to the ceiling, but up and back, just as I'm placing it. And as it lifts, I'm going to say the word up. 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 I'm a little late in my timing there speaking. I'm going to try and synchronize my up exactly with the finger lifting. Up, 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 up. You can, uh, if it's messing you up to add the voice in the beginning, you can save that for the next step. But eventually I do want you to get that voice in there so that you're vocalizing the ups. You're going to eventually cut out the voice, but for now it's important to speak that rhythm. I'm not thinking up and down. I'm only thinking one motion. Just up makes that motion easier and faster. Up, 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 up. Now I'm going to work on getting it faster, and that's eventually when you get comfortable with the routine. That's where you're going to want a metronome to help chart your progress and, and organize your practice. Up, 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 up. If I imagine a metronome clicking at 60. If I do two ups, up, 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 then three, four, six, I'm skipping five, but you can do five, that's, that's a little tricky. I'm skipping five, I'm going to do six ups, up, 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 up. Oh, those fingers are feeling nice and light. And now you can see at about six ups to a click of 60, it's starting to sound actually like a trill. So that even though we're starting with an uneven motion, in other words, not... They're getting close enough together now that it sounds like a trill. That's exactly how you want your trills to feel. So this is great. We've got a trill between one and two now. The next step is to work on the control of the endings. Trill endings are often really difficult for, for me and most players. Um, trill endings by which I mean... However it might end. Endless variety of trill endings, but you can work on them all by doing the following exercise. I'm going to go back to the single trill, the hot potato. Now I'm going to add just half a trill, which means that I'm going to end on the upper finger. Again, I'm going to be sure my two fingers are light, 
I'm going to imagine the fingers blending together, and I'm going to think only of the finger that I'm ending on. As I go back down, I'm going to end on the lower finger, of course. So I'm thinking only of the finger I'm ending on. Two, one, two, one. This is where that finger pressure might start to want to creep back in. So it's very important to keep that light, but the bow strong. Now I'm going to add another half trill. This is going to give me two full trills. So two full trills. With full trills, you always end on the lower finger. And when you're doing half trills, so you've got one and a half, two and a half, or whatever, you're alternating between ending on the upper finger or the lower finger. So here's two full trills. If I add another half. You'll notice I'm changing the bow wherever. I, I don't count you know, certain trills per bow or anything like that. You can keep adding half trills to do as many as you want. Usually once I get to three or three and a half, I'm done. I, I feel like I have my control where I want it. I think I did three and a half and then three, but you get the picture. And that's it. The next step is just to repeat that with all the other finger combinations. So we did one and two, but there's also one and three, one and four, two and three, two and four, and three and four. I'm going to get very mathematical about this. Now, here's a stumbling block for many people, the fourth finger, and it, it may very well be for you as it was for me years ago. You see how your one, two, and three are most likely already well behaved. In other words, when they lift, they lift generally with the same shape as they're going down. They're not lifting up to the ceiling or the wall or anything like that. But for a lot of people, right, the fourth finger, it can do anything at all, or maybe it goes down straight without a curve. These are all things that are going to get in the way of the trills. So you want all four of your fingers to lift the same way as they drop. Same shape, same path. Now, fortunately, I have a video about that fourth finger called a Pinky Power. So check that out if your four is exhibiting any of those uh, unhealthy symptoms. The fact is you've got to tame and strengthen that four if you want to be able to do real work on trills that involve the fourth finger. Um, if your four isn't quite there yet, don't worry. You can still do all the combinations that don't involve four. But if you try to work on four and four isn't behaving, it's just going to be too frustrating. Um, while you're working on four, you're still going to get enormous benefits to your hand frame. Uh, but when you can add four into the mix, that's when you're really going to unlock the power of your left hand to, to do all kinds of fast passage work. So if four isn't there yet, work on it but start working on the trill stuff with the other fingers in the meantime. Finally, you can bring in the metronome to chart your progress. Um, as I say, get comfortable with the routine first. Don't worry about matching it up with the metronome. But once you get comfortable, then you can start writing down your top speed for uh, the number of ups. So we did, I approximated clicks of 60 with six ups. You see if you can bump that up to 64, 68, etc. And keep a record of where you are. You may not be able to do six ups at 60 yet. Um, I just threw that out as an example. The other great use for the metronome is to start timing your trill endings. So if I've got, we'll go back to clicks of 60, boom. Now I'm not going to worry about how fast my trills are, but I want them to end exactly with the clicks. So. So however many I'm doing, whether it's one and a half, two, two and a half, I want the ending note to line up exactly with the metronome's click. I'm going to be really uh, strict with myself about that because that's exactly what you're going to need to do in pieces. What happens in a piece, you, know, you find you, yourself that you're not being able to end the trill. It just doesn't want to end. So you've got to work on that to be able to sync it up with the beat, with the piano, with the orchestra. And that's it. So. Go right to uh, natesviolin.com slash trills to get the worksheet that lays all this out, puts it there in order. You can print it out, put it on your stand, then you don't have to watch this video again. Um, and just get started, have fun with it. 
The next video I'm going to make is going to take this to the next level. It's a drill I do, and it's called Trill Drill. And that really works the hand further, and it also makes sure that you're covering all your bases in terms of the half and whole steps. It's a fun way to organize the trill work, keeping it fresh day to day, which is the only way you're going to do this day to day. All right, so thanks for following me here. Go to Nate's Violin, check out the other articles and videos, and I'll see you here again soon.